It is a Monday morning mailbag on a Tuesday afternoon, the 1st of 2024. So a very happy new year to the grounds crew from Adam and I on the walk-off. Honestly, it was another really fun year here on the walk-off. 2023 was most excellent. We had some guests that uh, we had no business having on the show. Uh, Adam now matching my background with his own. I love it. We are both. Uh, <laughs> Only one of us are on a tropical vacation. <laughs> yeah. But you in the comments have to guess which one. <laughs> <laughs> Who's really on the beach? Who's You'll never really... figure it out. <laughs> never... oh, there goes the mic. Right. Uh-oh, you're giving uh, it away there, moving yeah. your shoulder. Right. Honestly, uh, from the bottom of our heart, though, a very happy new year to all of you. Uh, thank you again for all the patronage. If you are watching this right now and you are not currently subscribing to the channel, well, Help us out. We're pushing 5,000 subscribers. We're moving up every single day. So we're about 200 off right now from hitting that milestone mark. So help us get there. Hit the like button. We'll get right into it. Every single week, we comb over your interaction. Adam's throat is down and out, but he's here. He's, He's being a trooper. He's pushing it through. So I will read the questions this time. And uh, we will go from there. You can always reach out on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast, on Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast, Patreon. You get that automatic Patreon bump if you are a member and supporting the channel that way. We make sure to answer your questions and comments on the Patreon, uh, or sorry, on the mailbag. And then, last but not least, the Discord is a Patreon exclusive, but we do comb through there and grab your interactions and comments from there as well. And on that, let's get into it. So we'll start with Twitter, okay? Uh, This was from Jasmine. She reached out last night. She says, hey, Scott and Adam, happy new year to you guys. I'm so down on where the Jays are at right now. Just seems like they refuse to add anyone significant. And even if they decide to, it seems like rebuilding is going to take a long time because their farm system sucks. Can either of you put a positive spin on the Jays for the new year? Adam, some positivity. And you are the king of toxic positivity. So we'll throw to you first here. (laughs) Um, There is almost no way that Vladdy is as bad as he was last year. I think that's, for me, like the cornerstone of my optimism heading into this season. Is mm-hmm. is that last season, we still went to the playoffs without Alec Manoa, who was mm-hmm. one of our best players the year before, and with a shadow of who Vladdy can be. So I'm not saying he needs to return to, you know, runner-up MVP form, but there's a massive window for him to take a couple steps forward and and have that be a massive difference in in the results for this This team. team needs power so bad and that was one thing that really hurt watching Vlad decline last year like he did is he still led this team in home runs with 26 like go through the amount of teams with out a 30 home run hitter. I think the Blue Jays were the only one. I I should have double checked, but I think the Blue Jays were the only ones who made the playoffs without a 30 home run hitter on their team. Crazy. And if you want a a positive spin, then yeah, I think Vladdy, he doesn't even need to rebound. Like Adam said, 2021, my God, give us what he had in 2022. And I think we'll take that gladly. Uh, Another positive spin on this is Baseball America just released their top ranked pitching organizations when it comes to the farm system. Now, yes, I know that overall the Toronto Blue Jays just ranked in at number 21 out of 30 teams for where their farm system sits. Pitching wise, the Blue Jays rank sixth behind only the Rays, Dodgers, Yankees and Orioles and the Mets. So the pitching lab is working. Ricky Tiedemann on the verge of making his major league debut. I know that the the naysayers, the negative Nancys out there will bring up Nate Pearson and talk about how prospects are never a sure thing. Obviously, that's true. However, Ricky's a top 20 prospect at this point in baseball America's list. 
He's a lefty who throws 99 and he's 20 years old. People constantly bring up his injuries. The only time he's been injured was last year. He missed a few months because of some tightness in his arm. They gave him the rest he needed. They built his innings up in the lab. They gave him some time in the Arizona Fall League. And fingers crossed, we're going to have a top-end pitching prospect knocking on the door. Now, one more positive I'll bring up here is... However you want to spin this, the Blue Jays starting rotation is still nails. Okay. Can we expect to see Kikuchi decline a little from his career year? Yeah, maybe. Can we expect to see Jose Barrios decline a little from last year after totally recovering from a stinker in 2022? Yeah, that's possible. I think it's safe to say Kevin Gosman's going to be who he is. Chris Bassett may decline a little bit, but the truth is there is so much possibilities on Alec Manoa recovering to even being a four ERA guy who logs 160 innings. That's not that insane. Those are pretty tempered expectations. And I think we need to see another stinker year out of Alec Manoa before he's actually a reclamation project. We've watched how much value starting pitching has. We just watched Lucas Giolito get signed by the Red Sox for $38 million for two years. So if the Blue Jays front office doesn't get an offer they want for Alec Manoa, and I, I think it's pretty well known that they are shopping him right now. But if they don't get what they want for him, they're not moving him. And I think to watch him recover a little bit from last year is a really safe bet. Anything to add there, Adam? No, I think you summed it up pretty well. And if you want to take another positive of it all, um, we watched friend of the show, Chad Dallas, move up the pitching prospect ranks. Uh, Connor Cook as well. They're both going to probably be starting in AAA. And I, th I think this is why the Jays pitching ranking has moved up so much in Baseball America's eyes is because they have some real legitimate dudes who could make their debut in 2024. And Sam Robursa and Adam Klofenstein, who were two of the top pitching prospects in the system, were traded at the deadline. For Jordan Hicks. So they even depleted the cupboards a little bit and still look pretty good. We'll leave it at that. We'll move on here to Johnny. He texted, uh, or sorry, he messaged us over Twitter. Hey, boys, I wonder about your thoughts on this sign. Justin Turner, get him for one to two years to play third base. Sign Martinez to a one to two year deal. For DH. Sign Bellinger to outfield, spelling weaker bats uh, on bad matchups, rest days, thus getting plenty of games in. Trade Espinal for starting pitching depth. I think the postseason is happening then and not a failure at that point. How would you feel about them going after Justin Turner as a stopgap at third base? 38 years old guy well, we just, with some real experience. We just saw what uh, Evan Longoria did in his twilight years going on a run with the Diamondbacks. Mm -hmm. um, I don't hate the Justin Turner to third base option. Uh, a a stopgap year. It would fit. It wouldn't be wouldn't be exciting, but it would be better than some options for sure. I think this is a super ambitious fantasy. All of these. It's a lot of free agency. To get all of these. Uh, JD uh, Martinez to DH and Cody Bellinger to outfield and trade Espinal for starting pitching depth. That's where we, I think, really fall into like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We're off to Narnia with this one. Yeah. Is, uh, I, I just don't think Espinal has the kind of value that a lot of Blue Jays fans think he does. Like, what did he play? 70 games last year? 90 games last year? As a, I know he was an all-star two seasons before, but like, I just... He could be a part of a package. For Honestly, Adam, depth, the but. signing of Isaiah Kiner-Falafa kind of backs up what you're saying, because I don't know if the Blue Jays truly believe in Santiago Espinal right now. Yeah. Yeah, I I think like I mean, I'm not anti Espinal. 
necessarily. But I, yeah, I do think that we saw the he had a rough best year we're going to see sure. out of him two years ago. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I don't. I just I don't know what we would get that would actually be starting pitching depth for just Espinal, other than Espinal plus. Like we're throwing in extra prospects, and I know they don't have to be too high, but. Espinal feels more, like a piece of a trade that also includes Manoa or that also includes Kikuchi or something like that. Where it's like an extra. Yes. Yeah. Where he's, he's the throw in guy on he keeps a, moving that needle a little bit closer to get them there. Type yeah. He's idea. the sweetener. Yeah. He's not the coffee itself, you know? Exactly. And that's a go. great way of putting it. And I mean, here. but you look at, you look at what, uh, Johnny is saying here and any one of those pieces on their own, I think work really well with dependent on what direction the Jays front office decides to take with this team, right? Like let's say they wind up spending their money on a Cody Bellinger. I think Justin Turner paired with that does make a lot of sense, right? You, you spend your wad on your outfield. Yes. There's still a, a hole at third base, maybe Justin Turner for $10 million, to play the hot corner, well, Aralvis Martinez or uh, Davis Schneider or Addison Barger gets another year. And by the way, speaking of Addison Barger, I read a really interesting report on the fact that he's getting a lot of right field reps and that the Blue Jays kind of view him more as a right fielder right now, which doesn't necessarily change your thinking at all when you're looking at a guy like Justin Turner, except that, yeah, maybe a Rolvis Martinez or maybe Davis Schneider is going to be given a legitimate chance to take that job. You know, if you bring in a guy like Turner on a one year deal where, yeah, you know, he can play some third base and play it. Well, he's 38 years old and he's on his way out of the league. Right. So that is going to give you an opportunity to maybe get a Rolvis in there, get him some, some reps, you know, like this is the thing with where the Jays are at and filling third base internally is there's not an obvious heir apparent, you know, like there's not somebody where they're like, okay, Damiano Pomigiani is killing it so much. Let's give him some leeway. Let's give him April to see how he does. There's nobody doing that yet. And I mean, yes, Damiano Pomigiani, uh, Aralvis Martinez, these are guys that might push their way onto this. And so that's where Justin Turner as a stopgap works really well. J.D. Martinez, I think, would be excellent fit on this team. But that's the thing with these guys are talking about, right? It's another Brandon Belt. It's another roll of the dice where you're like, do these old guys still have it? Are their, are their knees going to give out? Like every Time catches up with everybody. And J.D. Martinez and Justin Turner have avoided father time for a few years now, so it does have. make me nervous to go all in on that much age. Well, <clears throat> yeah, it's... Uh... <sighs> yeah, I don't know. If it's a, if one-year deals for those guys, though, like... Yeah. Uh, Even this if it's is like a, a perfect... one-year deal, hold on. If it's a one-year deal for like a Justin Turner or a Jacques Peterson, and by June we're like, oh, these guys are hitting 195 and slugging under 500, like whatever. They're just they're hitting yeah. badly. Even if it's a 10 million, 12 million dollar deal, like you can just walk away from those, right? Like you could just yes. cut bait if it's a one-year deal and go, ah. We tried. It didn't work. Bring up or Elvis, right? Or Elvis mm -hmm. is really thumping in AAA. Let's bring him up. And uh, I, I don't know. I'm I'm not afraid of of try and age ever on a one year deal, even if it's yeah. two of them. Um, it's the Springer deals that that start to scare a guy, right? Or like or going long term with a Cody Bellinger and being like, well, what are the last five years of that look like? Or you know, are the first five going to justify the last five? Because that's always the the thing, right? Like. Even George Springer's contract, even when we signed him, you know, six year deal, we, you knew going into it, the last two or three were going to be kind of stinkers, you know, like maybe, yeah. may, maybe he's still good, but you, you kind of knew probably the last couple are going to be painful and you just hope going into mm -hmm. it that the first few 
you don't care because you're like, wow, well, he's yeah, he's kind of old out there. But look at those glittering World Series rings he's wearing on his hand. That's so it's OK. But we never got those. Right. So, yeah, that's, that's the trouble. But yeah, on a one year deal. I don't I wouldn't even want to go two years with Jacques Peterson or or Justin Turner. We have enough young kids that are close and are knocking on the door. Right. Yes. Um, the guys like Davis Schneider. Those are uh, fun, unexpected. That's when you put on an old coat and you find $20 in the pocket and you're like, oh, yes, sweet. First couple of drinks are free tonight. That's what David Schneider is. Um, whereas Arelvis Martinez, um, you know, guys like that are like the lottery tickets that you're like, you're listening to the numbers be read out on TV and you're like, oh, I'm four for four so far. I just need yeah. these last two to match and we're laughing. And that's kind of where we're at with Arelvis, I think, is like, so far, so good in his development. He still has, you know, needs the next couple things to go right in his development. But so, so far, so good. Um, am I am I off I base wanted, with this? You're not off base at all. In fact, I wanted to circle back on something you brought up about Cody Bellinger and just the fact that the the Springer type deals is the one that do make you nervous. And I'm not saying that I have a source because I don't, but I do have. <laughs> Uh, buddies who say they have sources, you know, and basically where the league seems to be at on Cody Bellinger is nobody wants to jump in on a seven year deal. So Scott Boris is really pushing for seven or eight. And the rumors are, and the Jays are in the same boat as everyone else, but the rumors that I've heard is that everyone wants four to five years with Cody Bellinger and yeah. they're prepared to go the 125, mm -hmm. the 140 for that, yeah. but they don't want to do 200 over seven. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what's holding this up right now is that the years don't align between the Boris Corporation and the rest of the organizations out there. I think that that's the case with a, a numerous free agents right now. And so this may be why we watch the Blue Jays have a huge january is because they're waiting i've also heard that maybe there's some big time trades coming and it makes all this is the thing right if you look at the blue jays window we're all well aware bo vlad free agents 2025 this year feels Two like seasons. do or die right mm -hmm. like adam am i off base here like 2024 <laughs> feels like shit or get off the pot right like yeah well it, it definitely feels like i mean regardless of playoff success we need individual success from those guys. like mm -hmm. yeah everything else around them like is is important right um getting healthy seasons out of our starting pitchers getting more power out of dalton var show you know like these things having kirk yes. in form for the whole season and not having another kid this march yes. are, are all going to be valuable <laughs> yeah. Valuable to us, right? But if Vlad has another season that is, I was just reading on a Sportsnet article. They were showing his OPS for his career and how the uh, spike in 2021 is, uh, you know, a, a tough pill to swallow, but it is the outlier season until he proves otherwise, mm -hmm. right? And that yeah. that's the one-off. These aren't like bad seasons from a superstar first ballot hall of famer that it's a superstar season from, from a, a guy who is above average. above average. Yes. 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 Right. So the same way we talk about Espinal being a, for lack of a better word, a bum, right. A four, a, like a, you know, he's better than triple a, not quite a major leaguer who had, a great stretch of games and was an all-star that season. Right. It's kind of like that equivalent of what, for what Vladdy's done, unfortunately. Right. But at a much higher level, of course. Uh, but this happens to players all the time, right? They have that one awesome oh, season. Truly. Um, so for Vlad, this is, I think Vlad's season is going to be one of the biggest. Re ingredients in this cake unfortunately of what yeah. the future looks like because if he can show that <clears throat> 2021 is who he actually is 
and he's just been struggling for a couple of years, that sets the team in a different direction than if he has another slightly above average all-star-ish season, right? Like, I Because I don't yeah. think they could offer him a $300 million contract if he's just an all-star. I mean, he's a first baseman, dude. I know we keep uh, I, Joel and I had a really great talk um, on Saturday. I love, I love mm-hmm. Vladdy. Before we get into this, I am pro. Yeah. I'm rooting for Vladdy to be, of course, a superstar. So continue. Sorry. Me too. And I know one thing that Joel brought up was how quickly in a you know rebuilding style. You know, we're talking 2020, 2021, how quickly he was moved to first base, right? Uh-huh. Like, we we watched him basically the first time the Jays made the playoffs, playing third base in 2020, and then he got moved in 2021. Yeah. So, Joel's plan was to move Vladdy back to third. He thinks that that really solves a lot of problems. Vladdy's He's- got a big arm. Honestly, though, dude, I was looking at his defensive metrics at first base, and they were so ugly last year. It scares the shit out of me moving Vladimir Guerrero Jr. back to third base. I don't know if that is the solution. I will give Joel credit, though, because that is some really uh, good outside-the-box thinking, especially if you're going to go out and spend big money on Cody Bellinger, who does play some first base. It gives you versatility around that infield. It allows you to have basically three center fielders because if the Blue Jays went out and got Bellinger, you're sitting with KK, you're sitting with Dalton, you're sitting with Bellinger. All three of them, they might be the one, two, three best center fielders in all of baseball. So you're kind of in an embarrassment of riches there. But it would be nice to take one of those bats and put it at first base. So it does solve that problem. But honestly, I just, I just, and grounds crew, set me straight if you want, okay? Do you think Vladdy defensively has it in him at 25 years old to shift back to third base? The idea scares the shit out of me. I'll be honest. Where are you at, Adam? Do you, do you like, remember too, that he's three years removed from playing third regularly? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that the work that he put in to improve at first base initially Mm -hmm. wasn't, was impressive. And worth noting. Yes, it was. He did yes. become a gold glove first baseman. Uh, and I think rightfully so. I think he really put in the work to learn that mm-hmm. position and to get good at it. So tip of the cap to him there. So do I have confidence that he could if, you know, if the stars work out and, and that was the move that they made? And I don't think that that's likely as much as we might want it. I don't think that's likely but do i think he could learn third base again or relearn it um yeah i think that the work ethic would be there and i think he would rise to the challenge of it um the defensive metrics being down last year at first base um i'm not familiar with those advanced metrics but i would have to assume a lot of it would be measuring the weight of his like uh receiving the ball ability via it's, throws it's his via range hits. his range dude sucks okay yeah so the biggest thing i think uh, for joel's argument of having him play third as opposed to first is the arm is there we i don't think anything in his de- defensive metrics and correct me if i'm wrong i don't think he was making any throwing errors when he was scooping up a ball and throwing it to second or Mm -hmm. or anything right from first base so that even if the defensive metrics were down last year i have no reason to believe his arm strength has slipped or his accuracy on any of his throws would be an issue right so so that i'm okay with also here's an argument if if that's the case and again i'm unfamiliar with these defensive metrics um but you mentioned that range was what was killing him on these defensive Mm -hmm. metrics if he was playing third and didn't have to also worry about, I got to get back to first if there's a throw, right? Like every yeah. single time the ball is in play, Vladdy is thinking, I got to get to first, right? Wherever he plays, maybe he can't take that initial like 
step towards a ball that's hit towards the second baseman because in the back of his mind, he's thinking, oh, I got to get back to first, right? So maybe there's a little bit of gun shyness on the trigger to yeah. pursue that sort of stuff where, I mean, other first basemen are, are doing it are doing it better, apparently, like if, if his relative to the league is low. Um, I just mean that that would maybe be something that is less of an issue if he's playing at third and doesn't have to worry about getting to third. Maybe he's just Mm -hmm. go get ball, you know, like maybe he can just eliminate that piece of the analysis paralysis that might be what is causing his defensive metrics to slip in terms of idea, Same idea of giving Kikuchi too much time to think about it on the mound and that the pitch clock allowed him to just go, go. Exactly. Where you just put Vlad at third and you just go natural instincts. If the ball is hit towards the left side of the field, you're just going for it, right? You're either getting to it yeah. or you're not quite, and and hopefully it's uh, something Bo can get, right? But you don't ever have to go, oh, first step has to be towards first base because if it's hit to Espinal, I got to be at first, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe, so that's, again, that's the po- toxic positivity side of looking at it, of like, could he do third base like, More could he be Raphael Devers at third? Like, Devers was horrible at third base, and Boston let him just figure it out. Yeah. Because they knew they were in that kind of, like, not necessarily a rebuild, but they were in that phase of, like, let's let our star young third baseman become defensively proficient. Very similar to what the Jays did with Bo. I mean, let's be serious, man. They could have moved Bo half a dozen times over the last three years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I Okay. So we just spent the last five minutes justifying could Vlad play third base this year. And I, I think we both are in the camp that he could. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I want that, but I, I do think he could. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. So if, if the other signings that were possible, Right. If we let's just say Ross Atkins tried everything he could to get a third baseman and and to get whatever pieces, but the only pieces he was able to sign left us with a hole at third base and an abundance of DH first baseman, whatever. Right. Would you rather see him at third base or Kevin Kiermeyer at third base or or whatever? Right. Like if that was just the only way you could manipulate the lineup to make it happen, sure. But I don't think it's likely, even if Vlad went to them this offseason, it was like, I want to go back to third. Like That's my thing. Yeah. I, I think if he had not had these last two stinker offensive seasons, they'd be more willing to try it. Yeah. But I, I just think, ah, oh man, it's, do you want to add more to his workload and his, like when he's trying to fix his swing, when he's trying to whatever, to be like, also, we want you to learn a new position. Like, you know, I'd rather a 45 home run Vlad at first base than a 31 home run Vlad at third base. Yeah. So No, I'm with you, especially with how bad this team needs power. Uh, speaking of that, perfect transition for this next question. Discord was all in a buzz earlier last night. Um Earlier during the day, yesterday, I should say, when the rumors surfaced that the Blue Jays, Ben Nicholson-Smith, friend of the show, of course, let everyone know that uh, Jock Peterson is in play. He is on the Blue Jays' radar, somebody that they have checked in with. So Discord was all a buzz about that. Lucan chimed in and said, wouldn't be a bad signing. Much prefer to have a lefty DH in that spot, which is Jock Peterson. Hard to say if he'd do better than Brandon Belt, though. Higher ceiling, much lower floor, and he really did nail it with that comment on Brandon Belt because I think, I mean, I don't think, just look at his numbers. Brandon Belt was about as big a success with this Blue Jays team last year as he could have been, minus maybe lacking a little bit of power in the first few months of the season. And I think it was pretty apparent watching those first few months of the season that the Blue Jays do darn well. It was going to take time for Brandon to get out of injury mode and back into where he was in 2021. And 
some pretty good player development and scouting there. Cause honestly, the, the last few uh, months of Brandon belt outside of those injury stints, he was the best hitter in the, in, in the lineup. <laughs> so yep, to go out and get Jock Peterson, you're pretty much crossing your fingers and hoping he is Brandon belt. Right. Does like, does Peterson have more home run power? Like I should have well, looked this up. Um, Jock Peterson, in my head, is more of a power hitter than I think he really is. Um, yes, he's only he hit, puts up huge he, numbers in the playoffs. <laughs> he's only hit thirty home runs once in his career. That was in twenty nineteen. He hit thirty six home runs. Other than that, uh, he hit twenty six in his first full season in the league. Uh, mm-hmm. Sixth in rookie of the year votes. Otherwise, a couple of seasons of twenty five, and that's about it. Uh, even yeah. the OPS plus. It's like half of his seasons are under a hundred. 83, 95, 92, 98, 96. The other half. He's pretty much only slightly guy. above. Yeah. Like yeah. He, most of his, his good seasons, 126, 126, 125, 113, 111. Uh, two years ago was his career high in OPS plus at 146. Um, but he did that seemingly on the bat of a increased uh, batting average and on base percentage, not necessarily from the power. So yeah. the slugging wasn't his career high, um, but batting average and OPS or on base percentage was. So now Jock does hit lefties, by the way. He does. He, he, he does um, line up well if you want to play that splits game, right? Where maybe yep. Davis Schneider is... Uh, you know, and Jock is getting some DH time and Davis is getting some DH time and your George is getting some DH, you know, like maybe, maybe Jock and George or I, you know, like I, it's not perfect. Yeah. I think I'd it's... rather a JD Martinez personally. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how old's JD Martinez? Jock Peterson, 31. Um... JD Martinez is 37, I think. Okay. Yeah, double check there for me. Thanks, buddy. Um, JD Martinez. I know Justin Turner's thirty-eight. JD Martinez thirty-six. I gotta go run check my dog. 36. I just heard something in the kitchen crash. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so I mean, if you're if you're looking at the Blue Jays investing in one of those older guys, and I, I know Jock Peterson's thirty-one. He's probably the youngest of the bunch. Jock Peterson still very much fits into the same category, in my opinion, as J.D. Martinez or Justin Turner. I know that uh, Jock is a a lefty bat. So, again, his power numbers aren't really what you would hope they would be. The Jays need power so bad, and I, I hate to keep going back to Jorge Soler but man, he seems like the perfect power fit. Like if you're going to have a guy who plays offense or uh, sorry, who plays bad defense in the outfield, which Sorlair is a nightmare in the outfield, by the way. But if you can slot him into, let's say the DH spot, the majority of the time, and then get George off his feet here and there and put him in the right time and time from time to time. I, I, I really think you're going to get those 30 dingers. From a, a Soler, I don't think you're going to cobble your way to the power we need with a Jock Peterson type. I, I mean, what the hell do I know? But Peterson doesn't excite me. Let me know, Grand Screw. What do you think? Uh, so I was just listening to you talk about Jorge Soler. Um, I just... I know. Even he's it's... a roll of the dice if his power is going to show or not. Like 2019... For the Royals, he hit 49, 48 home runs. Yeah. Uh, that led the American League. Last season, 36 home runs. Mm-hmm. Those are his only two seasons with more than 30 home runs. Yeah. Uh, leading into last season, the home run totals look like this. Um, 27, 13, 36. So, yeah, it's just... I don't Some know, injury before... time, by the way, on the year with 13. 
Uh, yeah, you're right. 72 games played. Yeah. But just to, just to be fair, just to be fair. Okay. To be fair, but looks like quite a bit of injury time gets missed for him. Um, yeah. He's only played more than a hundred games four times in his 10 year career. Hundred and two of those. He hit bombs. Yeah. Yeah. So he hit a hundred and one. In 2015, 162 in 2019, 2021, he had 149 games, and last year, 137. So even when he's there, he's missing time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it feels like a worse version of George Springer with more power potential. I guess yes. like the, the ceiling for power is there, but I don't know, man. It's I don't, I think I'm talking myself out of Solaire. He's going to be 32 next year. Mm-hmm. What kind of contract do we got to give a guy who probably four years. That's the problem with Jorge, Jorge Solaire. And I think it's why he hasn't Ugh. signed yet. It's these guys want term man. And I, I understand I, that right now it's a it's a definitely a bad offensive free agent class so if you're a guy who's got some some upside you're gonna want to sign on as long as you can we're watching it with cody bellinger and of course jorge soler guaranteed is in the same boat where if he was prepared to sign a two-year deal he'd already have it right yeah i just i i think the existence of george springer prevents us from going and getting another guy like soler like I just think they're too. If we got to have a four-year deal to a guy that we're also going to have to manage workload, or accept the fact yeah. that he's probably going to not be there for half the games, if we didn't already have George Springer, I'd be more interested in in Solar. Yeah, I'd be like, okay, because you can manage a couple potholes in the road, but at a certain point, it's just like we're really threading a needle, hoping that. You know, time at DH. You know, and, what, you know what would really save this season, Adam, is if George Springer, at 34 years old, finds his power swing and cheats a little more, puts up more strikeouts, but hits 35 dingers. Because, my God, all these guys we keep bringing up, like, that could just be George Springer, right? Like, yeah, we could go out and sign JD Martinez, but if George Springer can figure it out, man, like, anyways, yeah. I'm yeah. getting more um, negative as we're getting into this. <laughs> all right, uh, here's one more negative for you. Um, as we were talking at the start of the show, Santiago Espinal, I think he's done with the Jays. I don't think he's. I think he's not on the roster on April first. Yeah. No, I get that feeling too. I get he's that in, feeling too. I he's think in that his arb years. Lo- yeah. Looks like he's going to cost like three million bucks, and I just think Davis Schneider for league minimum, or is that Santiago guy? Espinal for. It's yeah. like I've I've seen Davis Schneider enough of him to know. Yeah, he could be Espinal for a fraction of the price. So yeah. I just I've seen what I've seen from Espinal too. And I just, I just I think th- the upside of the bat with Schneider too is so much higher than like Espinal is what he is, right? Schneider, Schneider, we still don't really know what he is, right? So if you if you've got it, I think the floor for Schneider is oh, I left my dog outside and I can hear my wife stomping out of bed to go get him from Uh-oh. outside because he's barking, sorry, buddy. So. That's right. You're I was about to, to go deal get with him. that later. <laughs> oh, am I ever? Oh, I'd be so good to you. Um, <laughs> anyways, I, uh, David Schneider, I think the floor for David Schneider is not any worse than the floor for Santiago Espinal. If anything, yeah, the floor is better. And yeah. like you said, the upside is a little bit of a question mark still. I don't think he's going to have the same home run pace that he had in the small sample size last year. Oh, but, you don't think he's going to hit 50 home runs? Yeah. <laughs> no, but could he be a 25 to 30 home run guy if he was playing every day that's not a crazy possibility like it's one of the possible outcomes listed on that mystery bag that you're grabbing right so yeah whereas i don't think that's ever in the cards for espinal like i never i never see him come to the we saw his peak we saw his peak in 2022 right 
So when you combine that with the fact that he is 29, he's in his ARB years where he's getting, I mean, we'll see what the ARP number actually comes out to be, but something around 3 million, or you can have Davis Schneider with the same floor, essentially plays the same position, but maybe there's power. Like, I just don't yeah. know how you would justify keeping Espinal over no. Schneider. Like, Especially with IKF now in the fold. It's just like a really weird signing to also have Santiago Espinal as a Blue Jay. Yeah. Okay, we're getting long in the teeth. Let's get to these Patreon questions here. This one is from Wyatt. He says, Jays fans just want a store-bought cake, and I hate waiting <laughs> for a better-tasting cake at home uh, for – Oh, sorry. I screwed that up bad. Jays fans just want a store bought cake and hate waiting for a better tasting homemade one to bake. Drives me nuts. So obviously this is your metaphor, Adam. You love talking about baking cakes. And honestly, why it is correct in this scenario. We're sitting here January 2nd and there are a lot of needs still to be filled on this team. I think judging this organization where they're at right now is kind of silly. Obviously, we got to let the cake bake and see where things land. There's a lot of reasons to be negative if this is how the team looks April 1st. I think that if they go into 2024 looking like they do right now, they are a worse team than they were in 2023 and that is not good mm -hmm. but there's lots of time left lots of it's time been left. a slow moving off season yes the yankees did a little bit of heavy lifting getting on soto the yankees still aren't a finished product the red Sox have made some moves but the red Sox seem like they're doing this weird dance with their budget so like they went out and signed lucas giolito and then they traded chris sale and it's it's been interesting to watch what the Red Sox are doing. Uh, the Orioles have done pretty much nothing. Their starting pitching is still a question mark. The Rays. I don't know. There's a lot to happen still in the AL East. Like, there's a lot of signings and trades still to be made in baseball in general. Should be an interesting January. Sure made for a boring as fuck December, though. Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> um... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, buddy. I was, I was just going to say, on. You, um, you, you talked about the IKF signing with Joel on Friday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Catch me up. How do you feel about that? Is he an everyday player for the, like, is he our full time second baseman no. this season or is he no. like a Whit Merrifield role or what? Where does he fit? I viewed him far more as a Santiago Espinal role, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, utility guy. He plays third base very well, so he does have that defensive ability to be the stop gap if they're going to try and fill that hole internally. I honestly believe the Jays are still heavily in talks with Matt Chapman. I think Matt Chapman and Cody Bellinger are in the same position where everyone is like, yeah, you're great players. Mm -hmm. There's no way we're signing you to eight fucking years. Yeah. Right? Like, so I think Bellinger and Chapman, we're going to need to wait and see if the market drops out on them because they're not going to sit out the year. So these guys are going to sign and it, they might need to just deal with the fact that there's only four year deals available to them. And if you're looking at Matt Chapman, 80 million, Four years, I bring him back to the Jays. I know his offense sucked so bad last year, and it was just brutal watching him strike out on dead center fastballs. But a four-war player who's a sound defensively at the hot corner is Matt Chapman. Don't come around every day. That's a tough production to replicate and to fill. We, okay, we so got, when it comes, of, go ahead. I was just gonna say when it comes to IKF, I. I think his playing time is really going to depend on what happens at third base for the Jays. Okay. And at third base with Matt Chapman, we talked about giving just Justin Turner a one year deal as a stopgap. Would you mm -hmm. overpay for a Matt Chapman? 100%. Oh, 
on a one year deal. For one like, year? Yeah. Like yeah. if if the market twenty eight million? Yeah, we're spe- okay, so we're speculating if the market is twenty million a year for four years, an eighty million dollar deal. And the Jays sweep in and are like, hey, we'll give you one more chance to just try and extend what you did in April and try and prolong it over more of the season. And But do you think Matt Chapman would take that? Would he take the, or would he bet on himself? Would he take the $80 million in hand or one year at 25 I don't know. Million? Honestly, I think Matt Chapman is still probably dealing with the disappointment and the reality that, his $200 million guaranteed that Scott Boris was promising April 30th is not even close (laughs) to what is being offered right now. So, you know, if you're being told $200 million and your only offer is four years, 77 mil, uh, maybe, maybe you do be like, listen, pay me $26 million. That's more than the qualifying offer. It saves you your draft pick. We roll it back. And maybe I can get my big deal next year. Like Matt Chapman's only 29. He turns 30 this year. So like, you know, we'll see. Um, next By the year, way, it would be the most. Sorry, go ahead, Adam. I was just going to say next year's free agent class for third base might be a reason he wants to sign something long now, though. It's not like yeah. stacked, but it's not as shallow as it is this year. Alex Bregman. Bregman. Yeah. Yohan Mankata, uh, Eugenio Suarez. So there are some guys, Nick Senzel. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, I don't know what is going to happen with Matt Chapman. I would be. Me neither. There's such a wide list of outcomes and they all seem just as unlikely. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I agree, man. I agree. And you know, what's really interesting is that if the Jays do decide to go this route and bring Matt Chapman back on an expensive one year deal, like the fan base may have uh, to really rinse their mouth out because everyone will have just a, a little bit of throw up in there, you know, a little, little bit of puke. Mm-hmm. Just like it's it's about the least sexy thing that could happen. That said, it literally might be the best solution for the third base problem the Jays are in right now. I don't know, man. Like I was so sick of seeing Mad Chapman freaking swinging that bat and missing know. balls, but. That I said, know. dude, his defense, like, I know it's the least sexy part of the game, but my <laughs> God, he was definitely uh, a stalwart at third in his two years with the Jays. Everybody All right. craps on defense so hard, though, like, because we made the push for defense in the outfield uh, yeah. last year and all this stuff. But, like, I just don't think that we're having the same topic of conversation if Flatty hit 40 home runs. Yeah, I agree, man. Like, I think I if Laddie's hitting 40 and, like, we had maybe one extra bat in the lineup, I just think everybody's like, oh, our defense is I think people are excited about how awesome our defense is. Dude, listen to this, okay? So, George Springer in 2021 hit 24 home runs. And, or sorry, uh, it was, I think it was 19. It was just under 20, but he only played, like, half the year. Um, Bo Bichette hit 29 home runs that year. Vladimir Guerrero hit 48. Marcus Simeon hit 46. Teoscar Hernandez hit 26. Like there was just so many bombs being hit. And mm-hmm. then when you go and, and make a shift like they did in 2023 to defense and then get zero offense, like, mm-hmm. yeah, we're all a little gun shy. Fuck, I'm gun shy. And I'm trying to be as reasonable and as logical as possible here. But like, It does scare me to run back the defense and pitching and hope for better outcomes. Even if you look at the numbers and you're like, yeah, most of these guys, even if they just rebound to their career numbers, we're probably Mm going to be fine. Exactly. So uh, this is not a fun answer, but I do feel like if the off season ended today on paper, we're worse than we were last year. But I think we're just, I think there is a, coin toss probability that we're just as good like mm-hmm. what did we win last year 91 games 90 uh 89 Wait. games and i still think that this team wins. right now as is is probably an 85 to 90 win team that's what i mean the pitching's and, too strong man like the pitching's too strong if vladdy rebounds at all if varsho has a little more power in his bat like yeah there's just so many things that 
feel more likely than not. The biggest concern people when forget I say that, too, Adam, like, about but just the biggest thing that when I, when I justify that, like, Vladdy's probably going to be better than he was last year, or he's a bust, right? Um, but he's probably going to be better because I don't, I can't see him being any worse, as sad as that is to say that. I swear I mean that in a positive way. Um, but when I start making all those justifications, right, that like the season numbers from Vladdy have to be better, from Varsho have to be better. Uh, but then I go, oh, but we also got like, to be fair, the best case scenario from our pitching staff, other excluding Alec Manoa, right? But like everybody else was healthy mm-hmm. and pitched as well as you could ever ask Chris Bassett or Jose Barrio, like all four of those guys had career years as far as I'm concerned. And it just feels like that's asking a lot. If I'm saying that Vladdy's yeah. probably going to rebound, I have to acknowledge that our pitching staff also probably, probably won't be as good. Decline a little. Someone's yeah. going to have a major step back or a couple people are going to have a medium step back. <sighs> so, yeah. Yeah. But okay, let's end on this. Mish from Patreon says, I'm super happy to roll back to our team defense gold glove winning outfield. Last year, of course, she's talking about the signing of Kevin Kiermeyer. Uh, last year was the first year in many that I didn't cringe when the ball was hit to the outfield. Very true. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Fielding and pitching is, was solid. Let's get a couple big bats. Wake up our dormant bats. Improve the MLB so fucking wrong for slagging us, counting us out. Great way to end it. Yep. A little I positivity. A positive bow, right? Started positive, yeah. ended positive with a, uh, we'll call it a negative burger in the middle. <laughs> the okay, go. everybody. Right. Thank you so much. A very happy new year to all of you. You can always get a hold of us for Mailbag. We do it every single Tuesday afternoon. It's Monday morning Mailbag. Reach out on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast, on Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast. And of course, drop your comments in the YouTube uh, section here. Hit that subscribe, hit that like button. Patreon, you get the bump. Patreon, also a reminder, we are back for our writer's room for Around the Horn tomorrow. Yes. So, some more updates coming there. I know we did miss a couple MLB Mondays because they lined up on Christmas and on New Year's. I hope you forgive us, but we are back to regular scheduled programming. Here you go. All the best, everybody. Take care. You'll never guess which one of us is on vacation. Cheers. (laughs) Cheers. (laughs)